everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video. Today we're going to talk about the five things I wish I knew when I started out in miniature painting, which was too many years ago to mention. Let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V style. All right, I first just want to start with a little bit of history. I came to miniature painting through Warhammer, like many of us. I originally started playing Warhammer in 1990, I think eight, let's say, somewhere in the late 90s. Um, started with Warhammer Fantasy, got into 40K, got into Mordheim, all that kind of stuff. And I've more or less been playing ever since. Painting for a long time for me was really a task, a chore, something I hated, something you sort of did. Uh, I did paint my entire 40K army and then I sold it off, gave it away, so on and so forth. It wasn't something I had fun with. All of that changed in the early 2010s, sort of as YouTube came about and I realized there was a community of other people playing this game and making videos and content, I got more interested, I learned more. And as I learned, I enjoyed painting more because I wasn't fighting through things anymore. And that was many years into my painting. But through learning and understanding what I needed to do, it became less of a chore and more of something that I liked, and then from something I liked to something I loved, and now where it is today, which is an absolute passion that fuels me and is really what drives me to make this content for you. So today I thought I'd look back on what is now, you know, more than 25 years of doing this and think about what really are the distilled things I wish I knew. Some are tactical, some are philosophical, but I hope they're all valuable. All right, number one, and this is pretty important, but it's also very, very, very specific. And that is just when to use what brushes for what. I know this sounds so stupid, but it's really, I don't know, I think this is something I had a big problem with. When I started out, I had really crappy brushes. I didn't know what makes a good brush. I didn't even know how to use a good brush. And I think that I, this is something I really wish I knew more. So I'm going to break this into three simple categories. It's a little bigger than this, but let's keep it simple here for the purposes of this video. Number one, when you're slapping on big base coats or washes, working with inks or speeds or slap chopping or doing those things, a larger synthetic brush should be your go-to. Something in size four, six, or eight. Something that has a big belly and can hold a lot of the very liquid paint. Uh, this just makes your life easier. Brushes, when they're exposed to that much liquid, that much paint, will often get paint down in the ferrule, in the belly, that will cause them to split and or go bad. And so you want them to be cheap synthetic brushes. At the same time, not too cheap. I have a packed link down below that I quite like. It's what I use all the time for my uh, big synthetic purposes. Number two is when to use that nice brush. And it is good to have a couple of sable brushes, size zero, size one, size two, something in that area. Really one is sort of your masterpiece brush uh, to do the detail. This is what I use for my careful glazing, for sharp detail, edge highlights, and basically the finishing of the model. When I need to do those thin, sharp lines and careful details, this is what I get out. And so you're using very little paint, you're making small adjustments on the figure, and so the brush will last a long time, and you're not really risking damaging it. Third and final category is the dry brush. You know, when I started out, I got those dumb, expensive, flat, hobby dry brushes, complete waste of money, and a bad tool for the job. Whereas what you really want is something out of a big pack of makeup brushes that you can utilize, uh, as much as you want, you can wash them. They're all synthetic, so you can use alcohol or other abrasive cleaners on them to get them clean and keep using them. They'll actually last for quite a while if you do take care of them. But if you don't want to do that, you can also buy them in a big cheap pack, throw them away, and then move to the next one. Your call as to how much you sort of want to spend time and or love the planet and or both. Um, but really just understanding those three things would have been a game changer for me in my early years. Number two. Preparation matters, even though it sucks. Let's be honest. Model prep probably doesn't excite you very much. It doesn't excite me, at least. Uh, I know that things like carefully scraping and sanding and doing all of these various things really is one of the least interesting things you can do. 
However, I have I, I note over time that it just becomes easier to paint if your model is well prepared. It looks better, it looks cleaner. It's one of the simple things you can do that isn't painting to actually up your game. When people look at your model and it has lots of mold lines and things like that all over it, especially in very obvious places, it just makes it look amateurish. And this has been a hard thing for me to learn as well. I'm well known for missing this stuff. I just don't have the eye for detail, so I empathize with you. I'm also impatient and want to get to the fun, which is painting. But spending even a few extra minutes on your figures to get them prepped properly, using things like small sanding sticks and or just your simple X-Acto knife can really go a long way to making your figs look better, cleaner, and more well presented without you ever needing to learn anything about how to paint better. It's a simple step, but an important one. Number three, undershading just makes life easier. Boy, oh boy, uh, all those years I spent painting over black, trying to put yellow over black. Uh, here's a picture of one of the very first models I ever painted, this Empire War Wagon. Uh, and as you can see, nice yellow straight over black. High quality work here. And undershading and or, in other words, just using multiple tones in how you prime your miniature uh, is so valuable. This has become very, very, you know, fairly popular recently through things like Slap Chop and other associated techniques. But really it goes back centuries and it's just called Grisaille. It's about creating a sketch of light values under your work. Okay. And one of the important things to realize here, and what I wish I had known at the beginning, was that, you, one, you can do this at all, that this is a thing. And two, it doesn't have to just be black and white. You can use lots of different colors. You could prime in brown to something warm white if you're going to do a figure mostly in red or warm tones. You can use the standard black to white if you're going to use cold. You can do all of those different tones. You can get a little nuts. Put a little greens or little reds underneath. Like, you can prepare and undershade your miniature in many different ways to have many different effects. And I would encourage you here to not only think about using undershading, it's just a few extra seconds in priming the miniature, whether you're doing so through a rattle can, or an airbrush, or just a good old-fashioned dry brush. The reality is, is that taking this extra step makes it easier to put your next colors on, it makes those colors appear more true, and it gives you an amount of contrast, even if you're going to use relatively thick paint. It just makes your life easier. But explore, try different colors, see what you can actually accomplish, and have fun. Undershading is a technique that goes back centuries and centuries to the old masters of fine art, and they did lots of different undershading colors for their pieces, there's no reason we can't do the same. Number four, light matters a lot. I wish when I had started out, somebody had told me that the light was actually what we're doing, what we're painting, that everything is light. I think when we start out, our sort of basic concept is we turn the blue pants blue. And that is correct and fine, but also blue doesn't exist. What I mean by that is the actual color of a thing is so highly dependent on the lighting that's around it. Like right now, you're watching me through, I have multiple lights on each side of me that are set to various temperatures. I color grade this in my video editing software. All of that is playing with the light and all of that would change your perception of me. If you look at my skin tone under the fluorescence of my office alone without me color grading it warmly, I'll look pretty sickly and pale. I am a little too pale, but it's springtime. Summer's coming soon. Uh, however, if you're looking at me out on like in the golden hour near sunset on a beautiful, sunny, warm summer day, I'm going to look like I've, you know, bronzed and tanned and fantastic, right? A red car is going to look very different in bright sunlight versus a cloudy day. Black shirts will look different when they're exposed to very bright light and so on and so forth. Here is a picture of my wall. I've shown this picture before, but it really drives the point home. This wall is a white wall. Show me the part of this picture that is white. It doesn't exist. The, if I move over this thing with a color picker, I'm not going to find pure white. I mean, that's what colors my walls are painted. It's just pure sort of dead white, right? And yet, not to be found here. Because the light has a huge effect. And so I wish we would study more and think more about the light. Where is it at? What's the position of it? What tone is it? What color is it? And yes, that's complicated. And yes, that's confusing. I'm not going to lie. But understanding the fundamentals of light 
and how it works, and just even like taking pictures of your miniature under the different lighting conditions you're trying to represent, you know, putting it on your desk, putting a light over top of it, taking the picture of it, really does give you such an immensely powerful roadmap for understanding how and where to place your highlights and shadows, and it really does just make it easier to paint the miniature. I've got lots of videos in the playlist on this I would encourage you to go check out on this subject, but I will say there's always more to learn and we're going to talk about this one a lot more in the future. Everything is the light. Number five, the most important lesson in this video. It doesn't need to be perfect. That's it. I've given you a lot of tips about how to do things better, both in this video and in every other video I've ever done. And the reality is, I think when we start out, we think, oh, we'll just spend a lot of time and it will be perfect. No, especially when you're new, especially when you're beginning, you could spend all of the time, infinity time on it. It will not be perfect because you don't know what perfect is. You just don't have enough information. I can't build the perfect rocket because I don't know how to build rockets. I'm not a rocket scientist. Okay. I don't understand how any of that stuff works. You can give me all the time in the world, you ain't getting to the moon, okay? Not in anything I build. And it's the same thing with painting. When you're starting out, we'll oftentimes make mistakes, we'll try things, they'll come out wrong, we'll fail, and we'll feel bad about it. Don't feel bad, please. That's part of the journey every human has went on who is in this hobby. You count yourself amongst a proud cohort when you fail. For you are walking the same steps that I and every other professional artist that you have seen have also trodden. All of us started out. All of us had bad miniatures. All of us failed. Here is a couple of my early miniatures. Look at these things. These are train wrecks. Terrible. Terrible miniatures. I failed so often. And yet, I kept at it. And why? Do we keep pushing on? Because through that failure, we learn. When you make something and it's not perfect, that's okay. Be done. Learn from it. Look at it. Figure out what you did wrong. Talk to others around you. Get feedback if you can and paint the next miniature. As you continue moving through the hobby, you will learn more. I don't know if you'll ever paint a perfect miniature. I'm not sure that such a thing is possible. But it doesn't matter because you will continue to grow. And you, a year from now, will absolutely blow away you, you know, that, that you right now. There we go. In other words, future you is better than present you. You get it. The idea that you have to try to, that if you just keep investing time and paint really slowly when you start, you'll create something great or perfect is nonsense. It's nonsense. You don't have the knowledge to do it. So don't. Paint, get it painted, try things, learn, and then move to the next miniature. Perfection isn't the goal. It can't be the goal. It cannot be achieved. And it shouldn't be what you're aiming for. That only sets you up for failure. Your goal should be to have fun, to paint a miniature, because a painted miniature is better than an unpainted miniature, full stop. So once you paint it, accept its flaws. Learn from them, love them, and move to the next one. And the next one will be a little better. And the one after that, a little better than that, and so on and so forth. And there may be setbacks along the way. Maybe one won't be slightly better. Why? Ask people for what went wrong. Figure out where you messed up your technique. Maybe watch a video or two about it in my playlist about whatever technique you couldn't get right. That's why I made this channel how I did. So you can always go back and find your answers to those particular questions that you've got. And then do it again. The next miniature might not be perfect, but it is the next miniature. And that makes it great. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you've got questions, if you're just starting out in the hobby, post those down below. I always answer every question that's asked of me in my comments. If you want to support the channel, lots of ways you can do so. There's affiliate links down below where you can pick up things like new paint or some of the brush sets I mentioned or anything like that. That doesn't cost you any extra money but it gives a nice kickback to the channel. There's also the games down there that I make with Uncle Adam, uh, as well as some merch.
But of course, if you do want to take your next step on your hobby journey, we'd love to have you as part of our Patreon. That's a community focused on review and feedback. So, no matter what you do, I thank you so much for watching this one, and as always, we'll see you next time. Thank you.